So without further ado, allow me to introduce our novelist to you. Leanne Moriarty is the author of six internationally best-selling novels, including The Husband's Secret and her latest book, Big Little Lies. It sold over a million copies in the US alone. And as a result, Leanne became the first Australian author to have a novel debut at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Graham Simpson in the middle is the author of the huge hit The Rosie Project, which has sold in more than 40 countries around the world with Sony Pictures buying the film rights. It was Australian Book of the Year for 2014 and the sequel is the delightful The Rosie Effect. <clears throat> And Terry Hayes is the author of I Am Pilgrim. He began his career as a journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald. He went on to become a successful screenwriter, having written the screenplays for Mad Max 2, Dead Calm and Bangkok Hilton, among others. Um, so I'm just going to begin very um, generally and ask each of you uh, to give me a sense of what your latest book is about. Graham, we'll start with you. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right in the middle. Uh, look, I we said we'd do a reading, so why don't I do that while I walk over? This is the sequel to The Rosie Project, in which Don Tillman, socially challenged professor of genetics, sets out to find the perfect partner scientifically. Um, at the end of that book, he has more or less achieved that, and in the second book, The Rosie Effect, he faces the challenge of fatherhood. <clears throat> To solve the immediate nutrition problem, I selected a vegetarian recipe at random from one of the websites. A jog via Trader Joe's sufficed to source all the necessary ingredients for a tofu and squash flan. I was left with an afternoon of unscheduled time, an ideal opportunity to do some research in line with Jean's advice. It seemed wise to delay the shower and change until after the excursion, especially as the weather forecast indicated a 30% probability of rain. I put my light raincoat on over my jogging costume and added a cycling hat for hair protection. There was a small playground on 10th Avenue, a few blocks away. It was perfect. I was able to sit on a bench alone and watch children with their guardians. Binoculars would have been helpful, but I could observe gross motor actions and even hear some conversation, especially as much of it was shouted. I was not disturbed. In fact, on the sole occasion the child approached me, it was immediately summoned back. I made several observations in my notebook. The children explored for short distances, but routinely checked and returned to their guardians. I recalled seeing a documentary in which this behaviour was made more obvious by fast motion replay, but could not recall what type of animal was involved. My phone had substantial available memory, so I began shooting my own video. Jean would definitely be interested. My recording was interrupted by some kind of communal activity. The guardians and children gathered together for approximately 20 seconds and then moved to the other end of the playground, where my view of them was obscured by a central island of foliage. I followed and sat where I could observe them again, but they did not resume their play. I decided to wait and use the time to change the video resolution on my phone in case there was an opportunity to film a longer segment. Due to my focus on the camera operating task, I did not notice the approach of two uniformed male police officers. In retrospect, I may not have handled the situation well, but it was an unfamiliar social protocol and unexpected circumstances driven by rules which I did not know. I was also struggling with the video application, which I downloaded because of its superior compression algorithm without due attention to its user friendliness. What do you think you're doing? This was the marginally older policeman. I guess they were both in their 30s and in good physical shape. Body mass index is approximately 23. I think I'm configuring the resolution, but it's possible I'm doing something different. It's unlikely you will be able to assist unless you're familiar with the application. <laughs> well, I guess we should just get out of your way and leave you with the kids. Excellent. <laughs> get up. This was an unexpected change of attitude on the part of the younger colleague. Perhaps I've seen a demonstration of the good cop, bad cop protocol. I looked to good cop to see if I would receive contrary instructions. Do you also require me to stand up? Good cop assisted me to stand. <laughs> Forcefully. My dislike of being touched is visceral, and my response was similarly automatic. I did not pin or throw my assailant, but I did use a simple Aikido move to disengage and distance him from me. He staggered back and bad cop pulled his gun. Good cop produced handcuffs. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, and Terry and Leanne, feel free or not to do a reading or stay seated or go to the podium, do, how, do it however you like. Um, so Terry, give us a sense of what is I Am Pilgrim about? Um, Pilgrim is the name of a covert intelligence agency for a very, very secret American organisation called The Division, and he gets involved in a worldwide hunt for a terrorist who is planning a catastrophic biological attack on America and uh, people have been kind enough to say that it's a page turner. It needs to be, it's 800 of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I'm often asked, why did you write such a long book? I have no good answer for that. I just couldn't stop. Um, <laughs> and that, so yes, it, but it's set very much in, in today and it deals with leading edge science. Um, I did have one great review from a microbiologist at Fort Detrick, otherwise known as Fort Doom, the American you know, secret weapons laboratory, and he told me I got most of the science right. I'm still looking for my high school science teacher who <laughs> said I didn't know, you know crap from a granola or something. So um, yeah, it's a page turner and uh, it's in the in the vein, I guess, of a Frederick Forsyth novel, but much updated. I'll ask you a bit about the science later, because I found that a really intriguing part of it. But first, let me bring in um, Yulian. What's Big Little Lies about? Big Little Lies is a story of three women who start, um, their children start kindergarten for the first day. And on that day, a particular incident happens. Uh, and as a result of that, there are a series of events over the next few months that culminate in a school trivia night where all the men are dressed up as Elvis Presley and all the women are dressed up as Audrey Hepburn <laughs> and somebody ends up dead, um, possibly murdered. Uh, so it's a whodunit, but from the beginning of the book you don't actually know uh, uh, either who the murderer is or who the victim is mm -hmm. either. Um, the thing, um, reading all three of your books that really blew me away was the level of research um, and intricacy that had been invo involved in the creation of the plot or the creation um, of the voice um, or the creation of that world and how thoroughly, you know, I was immersed in that. Um, Terry, let's go back to you just because you did raise the science for that. How did you learn so much about... There's the creation of a biological weapon in your book, um, which is a weapon that is at the cutting edge of what's mm -hmm. known about science and how you actually spread weapons. How did you even begin to learn about that? Um, I, I, my view is that uh, the, the access to the internet has, has changed writing enormously. Um, I could never have written the book without the internet because I would have had to have been down there at the Mitchell Library or the British Library reading room, getting books out of the stack. And after a few weeks of that, I would have given up. Um, because if I can give a very simple example, I got stuck on what the currency is in Syria. Um, now, if you go back in the old days, you know, I would have to have called up the Syrian embassy and asked them this. Then ASIO would have been listening, and then I would have had the knock on the door. Um, and, that, and so what you tended to do back I think, you know, I know this from journalism, you tended to spend a lot of your time skirting around issues, saying, well, I don't want to make a mistake, so I'll just say the Syrian currency. Whereas now it's just a click away. So when I got involved in being coming interested in viruses and where the real leading edge research is on that, I just started to read. And, and you know what it's like when you look for something on the internet you go down this rabbit hole and then down the next rabbit hole and you find stuff and you're making notes and you're trying to remember, oh, where did I read this? And I got immersed in it. I, and I think that audiences or readers are, are looking for that verisimilitude because if I'm not looking at, looking at it on the internet, other people are. And I can't tell you how many people <laughs> have written things about you were wrong about this. <laughs> and that, because they Google it. I said at one stage there were tides in the Mediterranean. Oh my God. <laughs> the argument is still going on. <laughs> and this is 18 months later. So but, it, what, but it's fiction, so why should you have to have that level of detail right? Um, because I think peop anything that takes somebody out of the story is a problem for them. And 
There are tides in the Mediterranean. The question is, how noticeable are they? And don't ask me about tides in the Mediterranean, I can tell you that. But I think it takes them out of the story and they say, oh, that's not true. But I, I'm very proud of the fact that they believed everything up until then because I, th I think our job, I try to convince you of small truths so that I can sell you the big lie. <laughs> and uh, if I can do that, I'm very happy. What do you think, Graham? Um, my, my, look, I, I agree totally with Terry. The internet has made the, the quick check so much easier. And the research I do is the, sh the small stuff on the internet, um, but the, the bigger stuff, um, either from a substantial book um, or from people I know. So in the rosy effect, you know, Don is preparing for fatherhood, and he does so scientifically. So he obviously buys a copy of what to expect when you're expecting and pretty much memorises it. Um, and my wife said to me, she said, you know, when I was pregnant, you never read that book. So, <laughs> um, But, you know, that, that, was, that was great input. She was great input because she's an ex, she works in perinatal psychiatry, so I had conversations with her. And that just gave me some, some ins to, to how you... Um, handle a pregnancy, and then whenever I needed some, some minor piece of information, such as, you know, is it safe to eat, eat oysters in pregnancy, I get on the net, get the latest stuff, the, the, the academic references, and that suits Don, and it's all there, so very swift. How about the creation of Don's voice? Because it's such a unique voice, and it's so, I imagine to write it, it's almost a way of thinking to get into that sort of headspace. Yeah, look, it's a combination, of it's voice and it's voice reflecting personality and character. And that was certainly the hardest thing about the Rosie Project, and it's, you know, it's its greatest strength. Um, so I, I started off with a friend, a guy that I've known since I was in my 20s, so we've known each other for 30 odd, odd years, we go jogging together regularly, and he speaks to and at me as we jog. Um, so I've got a very, very clear idea of his voice and I can do impressions of it. So that was my... <laughs> Is there some problem with that? <laughs> um, so, so, so that was my starting point. And then I, you know, I, I wanted a character who was somewhat different to him, the personality behind it, and, and that, that evolved. Um, and you use principles. I mean, Terry would know from screenwriting, and I guess it's you know, much the same if you've got a novel writing background, that, that a sense of purpose for somebody is a tremendous way of building empathy. So I made Donna absolutely never say die guy. No matter how many setbacks he has, he just says scientific problems require perseverance. On we go. Um, so that was a, a characteristic that I guess my friend doesn't have you know, anything like that. Most people don't. But I gave him that. So you build up from there. Um, Leon, what about, just if we circle back to the research, um, what's the process, the research process for you? books I have had to do research so for example for the hypnotist love story uh, I had to I go off and see a hypnotherapist um, get myself hypnotized um, did you have to stalk anybody <laughs> I didn't know well my husband did have uh, when I first started going out with him he did have a girlfriend um, who was having trouble letting go of the relationship oh. um, but she was disappointingly uncommitted she didn't oh. she didn't stay around so I didn't get that much material from her. <laughs> I love how you Wishing your husband's ex-girlfriend had hung around because it would have been great to get yes, a bit more material. <laughs> um, yeah. But I went to the hypnotherapist. Actually, I was trying to get pregnant at the time, uh, and I said, "Well, I'm doing this for research, but at the same time, why don't you treat me as if I'm a, a client who's come to you and saying I'm having trouble getting pregnant?" Uh, and nine months later, I did have a oh. little baby girl. Um, but I was at one. Uh, uh, event and somebody in the audience put their hand up and said, was the hypnotherapist a man by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're, all a, you're all a lot quicker than me because I, I just said, no, it was a woman. <laughs> you took and me then, a second to yes, yeah. Well, it wasn't until I woke up in my um, room in the hotel in the middle of the night, so she thinks the hypnotherapist <laughs> was the father of the child. So no, I didn't get it. Uh, but for... Um, and for my new book, I do have a pole dancer, and I do see a lot of men in my life, including, <laughs> horrifyingly, my own father, have offered to come and help me do research <laughs> on the pole dancer. Um, but with Big Little Lies, because it's all about school mothers, and I was only just, my little boy had just started school, basically I was in that environment, so I was just... Uh, observing and listening. Um, do um, the other mothers know that you're a writer? They do now. <laughs> 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 um, 
but it's funny, they do tend to, uh, that people will come rushing up to you and say, I've got a story, I've got a wonderful story to tell you. Or even, I'm actually the manager of the soccer team, and there was one, I was actually getting into a little heated debate with one of the, uh, the mothers, and as our emails were going back and forth, she actually put in brackets, feel free to use this in a novel one oh. day. <laughs> so everybody's aware. <laughs> do you get that, Graham, with people coming up and going, oh, I've got a story to tell you? Oh, look, I think we all do. I think, um, and people think that that's all there is. That, that you know, This amazing thing happened to me. If you wrote it, it would be a bestseller. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful faith in my ability as a novelist <laughs> to take something relatively mundane or something which might be exciting as an incident but doesn't have the legs to be, to be a novel. Um, yeah, I mean, that said, it's things that have happened in my life and in the life of others around me that do provide the raw material, the inspiration for the novels. Um, I mean, then people, but by the time I finish with them, people will not recognise them on the page. Um, you know, my, my friend who in, um, inspired the Rosie Project, there are three incidents that were absolutely inspired by things in his life. He recognised none of them. You know? mm. And I, you know, qu quite often that's the case. Then you get the opposite, of course, when people say, you, you told that story about me. I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Terry, I'm presuming that you don't know any um, terrorists building a biological weapon. <laughs> so no. <laughs> what's the source? Where, where did your idea for this book come from? Um, yeah, I, I've always been interested in leading edge technology, you know, and uh, I remember reading a, a story many years ago that some guys in upstate New York had um, recreated the polio virus. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And it was the first time that anybody had created, you know, viruses are neither dead nor alive. They're a strange thing. But the first time, if we call them a, a life form, it was the first time anything had ever been created from off-the-shelf materials. You buy the chemical letters, you basically glue them together, and they made the polio virus. Now, there's 8,000 genetic letters, I think, from memory, um, in the polio virus. The virus I was dealing with has 190,000 genetic letters, so there's a big degree of difficulty. But I was very interested in this because I thought, if you can do it with 8,000 letters, you can do it with anything. And I would have sort of left it at that. But then I thought to myself, why did these guys do this? Why, if you're a research biologist in upstate New York, why would you spend your time doing this? Well, the, I found the answer. They did it because the Pentagon paid them a quarter of a million dollars to do it. Why would the Pentagon do that? Because it wanted to find out if it was possible for terrorists to create their own biological virus. So they paid these guys a quarter of a million dollars to do it, to fund it. They duly did it, then they published their results. So that every terrorist can now read that you can do it. And this is what they call in the CIA blowback. Mm. The unintended consequences of a seemingly good idea. Like we will give the Taliban, we'll give the Afghans stinger missiles to bring down those Soviet gunships. Oh but now they're using them against US gunships. So I read that and I thought, this is how the world works, in my view of the world. That you end up with this ridiculous situation. And I thought, good God, if I can read about that, somebody else can. So I thought, how can you get the genetic letters of the virus that I'm talking about? Now, this was once one of the most closely guarded secrets in the world. It took me about an hour to find it, and I got it. And that's when I started to get scared. <laughs> yeah, you're scaring the bejesus out of me <laughs> yeah, just listening to you. <laughs> because you give us 10 years as the general sort of estimate, that attack on those World Trade Center towers is going to look like a walk in the park. That's Islamic cave dwellers. We're talking about people who are technologically extremely proficient. Sure, they behead people, but they put it on Facebook. They know modern technologies, and there's more than enough hate out there. Yes. So, I, so I, I wrote it. <laughs> the um, intelligence side of your book too, Terry, like the secret, the division and whatnot, is that um, also, did you make that up, or is that actually a, a part of the... Well, it, it, 
anybody that's thinking of writing a book, I can honestly tell you the best thing to write about is intelligence services, because they're going to deny whatever you, you write. <laughs> they will deny it. But everybody's going to say, oh, that must be true. That must, if they're denying it, so you can say whatever you want. <laughs> um, I was a journalist in New York when uh, we were involved in the Vietnam War, and uh, a great Australian journalist called Max Such, who was the editor of the National Times, called me up one day and he said, why don't you do something about the CIA's influence on Australia? Oh, oh, that sounds interesting. So I've always been interested in it. I never stopped being interested. So I brought a lot of that to it, the verisimilitude of it. We spoke about um, voice and Don's voice and what a unique voice that, that is. Leanne, with your book where you've got a group of um, school mums, how do you go about the creation of different voices so that not everyone seems the same? It's, it's tricky. So, well, with Big Little Lies, I've got the three main characters who um, I needed to create properly. And I think my process sounds like it's quite similar to Graham's in that I often take one personality attribute. So, for example, with the character of Madeline, I was just thinking about those sort of people who are always outraged, who are always enjoyably outraged <laughs> over something. And you're quite, it's quite stimulating being with them because they're always saying, I can't believe this happened. And they're writing off letters to the papers and all that sort of thing. Uh, and I really love those sort of people. Uh, and so I took that attribute and then I just did other little things around her uh, and then gradually... And for me, I need to start writing her. I need her to start doing things. Um, so in the beginning when I write, she's quite wooden. Um, or he is quite wooden, and I, I, I sort of hate it in the beginning because I feel this is terrible, um, but gradually she starts to move. So I always think, um, now I'm trying to, you know, I've had the opportunity to meet Nicole Kidman, and I was trying to think of ways in which we were similar. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, I do also need to call upon little parts of myself so I need to relate in some way, even if it's somebody who's totally different to myself. So I was thinking maybe it's a little bit similar to acting in that they, you know, presumably when they're sobbing over something, they're remembering something from their, um, from their past. I didn't bother to try and work out. I didn't ask her if that's how we were similar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's... A, yeah, and then by the end of the book, or two-thirds of the way through, I understand her, and then I can go back and fix the things and say... Well, now I know I, sh I know she wouldn't have said that or she wouldn't have done so that. So you make it more yeah. consistent with the yeah. voice that's then evolved. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, do you basically, do you figure out a plot and go from there? Do you figure out the characters first and go from there or is it all part of the one process? No, and I haven't yet um, done a book where I have worked out whether I've had a plan. I've always just had a premise. So with this one, I knew that... Uh, there was going to be a school trivia night and then I knew there was going to be some big riot at the night and I knew, I originally thought maybe, uh, so, and so the men are dressed as Elvis, the women as Audrey, I originally thought maybe a couple of Elvises and one Audrey um, might die, uh, but I didn't know what had actually caused that event, so I just tend to um, make it up as I go along. So, but it's hard because it means I'm creating these terrible dilemmas and then I'm thinking, how do I get my characters <laughs> out of them? So that's why, for me, the very worst thing that a reviewer can ever say is to say it was predictable because then I think, well, you're very clever. <laughs> because yeah, I they, couldn't they, predict they it. they lie. They mm. say it was predictable. Mm. And I, I've had people say that about, you know, about my first book in particular, mm. and, oh, and about the second book, and yet when I grab people about three quarters of the way through and say, all right, guess the yes. ending now, <laughs> yes. yeah. they, they invariably don't. <laughs> they don't. So, no, so no, there. Yeah. Just, it, right. It's a very easy after the event to say, oh, I saw that coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was at a session yesterday, and we were talking, off on Friday, um, and we were talking about the issue of likability and whether it's something that you need to think about regarding characters, whether it's irrelevant, whether it's ridiculous that audiences expect people to be likeable, um, or that, you know, these authors were saying sometimes readers come up and go, oh, they wasn't very likeable, or critics might say, they were, you know, why was he so unlikable? Um, Graham, let me ask you, Don, you know, such a unique voice and he's quite... Um, you know, I guess rigid in some ways, was likability anything you had to think about? Absolutely, because in spite of... It, I studied screenwriting first, and the Rosie Project was initially a screenplay. Um, 
And in spite of the screenwriting teachers saying to you, likability isn't all that important, it's about empathy, dog day afternoon, we're rooting for Al Pacino and so forth, you know, their constant criticism of the Rosie Project was, we don't like this guy, he's a jerk. And I had to work very, very hard on you know, likability. And there's a bunch of tricks you can use, all the way from the Pat the Dog, the little old lady that he's nice to, and so forth, through to surrounding him with people who are less likable, like, <laughs> Jean, like Jean the Philanderer. So you say, well, I've got to go with someone. <laughs> yes. but, you know, I'm not going with Jean the Philanderer. Um, but yeah, I like to. Or, by, by, by far, you know, the thing that's really pushed very hard is the one that says, give them a mission, set them out on some mission, even though it is a robber bank, and in Don's case, it's one that we can relate to, which is to find connection, and we will relate to that mission, in the, and particularly if he's under-equipped for that mission. If you're slightly under-equipped for a mission, you have drama. Yeah, you have It's just like you know, Sylvester Stallone, you know, Rocky, da, 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 he's, he's not ready for it, but yeah. we can see him getting there. Yeah. But if you'd cast, instead of Sylvester Stallone, you'd cast Woody Allen in that movie, <laughs> You, you, you say, hello, this guy's not going to be heavyweight champion no, no matter what. <laughs> then you've got comedy. So if you make the gap big enough, you, you've, got, you've got room for comedy. Um, but you know what happened? As soon as I made it a, a novel, that problem largely went away because we're inside Don's head. So we understand where he's coming from. He gets a chance to tell his own story. So he became a great deal more likable. And I get women writing to me saying, I would marry Don Tillman. <laughs> you know, I, I would be prepared to stop being a vegetarian if I could marry Don Tillman. And I'm thinking, you do not know what you are saying. You have no <laughs> Terry, what do you think about the likability question? Well, it, it's a loaded question for me because um, I would write chapters and give them to my wife who had the dreadful job of reading them in bed before she fell asleep. And about halfway through, I said to her, I asked her that question, I said, what do you think about him, really? I mean, he, just him as a character. And she looked at me, she said, but he's you. <laughs> and she said, if you were a covert intelligence agent, that's you. <laughs> I still don't know whether he's likeable or not. <laughs> um, well, she's still with me, so I suppose to some degree and that was true. Yeah, I, I wrote it in the first person. Um, and, uh, and like Leanne was saying, I went through an acting, I mean, I've thought a lot about acting from my screenwriting career, and I acted that character. I would, I would think of everything about how he would react in any scene, and I thought, what would I do? How do I find that emotion? So to me, it, yes, he's not entirely me, but there are elements to him that are me, so... Um, well, you know, I have my fair degree of self <laughs> of self loathing, but you know, there's part of me that I like. So, um, yeah, so it was a lot easier. I mean, I, I admire, um, you know, authors that can just create it out of whole cloth. Um, well, we hope that Don's out of whole cloth. That there's not too much relationship there there with with Graham. But um, for me, it was me. <laughs> I, wonder, I would sort of wonder if Brett Easton Ellis gets this sort of stuff, you know? Well, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Exactly. Um, Leanne, where do you stand on the likability question? Yeah, I think I do need my characters to, in the main, be likable. I, I, want, I want to like them myself because I have to spend so much time with them. I said at a panel yesterday that I did only once um, base a character very much on an, an angry ex-boyfriend and then I took great pleasure in killing him off <laughs> early on. Um, but apart from that, I do, I, I want to like them, even if they are doing, even if they've got flaws. Um, I think, I just, th I always think it's more interesting when good people do bad things than when they're just 100% horrible. I can throw in just, just something that was fascinating to me. The protagonist in The Rosie Project and The Rosie Effect is very, very clearly Don Tillman. But in the US in particular, they marketed the first book as chiclet, essentially, even romance, and hit a readership who read almost exclusively books with a female protagonist. And rather than transferring their affections, as it were, or whatever, their, their, their empathy to Don, they tried to hook on to Rosie. And Rosie is quite present in the first book, but in the second book, she plays a much mm. more background role, and they hated this. 
you know, what, what's going on? Rosie's off the page. Don's out with the, the boys. The marketers hated it, or the, or the, the, the readers. The readers. The, the first, not all the readers. Right. Thank goodness. But that, you know, but Simon and Schuster got the book out to all these romance readers and chiclet readers first off, and they said, you know, yeah. where is Rosie? And you know, there was one local review which said much the same sort of thing. And the answer is, you know, this is a story about Don Tillman in a marriage, trying to deliver 90% because Rosie's actually a little bit, you know, depressed, miserable, pregnant, um, got got her. PhD supervisor living in the house, um, who's the Flandering Jean and so forth. You know, she's having a really, really tough time, and this story is Don has to step up to the plate. Um, but if you were trying to read it for Rosie rather than read it for Don, that's a very odd way of going about the book. It'd be like reading for the, yeah, for the terrorist rather than for the... You know, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Um, I hate the term chiclet as well because it's sort of like this derogatory um yeah, it's it like mummy bloggers like i think well just because something's directed at women or whatever so um how are your books marketed in the the u.s leanne, leanne what sort of um audience do they try and um, hit it's got to be a I mass general audience right it's just selling a million yeah <laughs> Um, three million now. Um, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I know there are a lot of women readers, but there are a lot of just women. Women read the most anyway. Mm. Mm. So I always really struggle with. Um, with I remember saying to a lady in a bookshop there in America, I said, "Would you call my books women's fiction?" And she said, um, "What are you talking about? Women aren't the only ones who buy the fiction, so it's fiction." <laughs> right. uh, but then there was another one who said, "Yes, I would call it women's fiction because you have." female characters um so i i really struggle with that and so if somebody asked me at a party what sort of books do you write i'd have no i wish i could say yes. i wrote crime i say i write, I write novels mm -hmm. my um, objection to it being called women's fiction for either is mm. if, it's, if it's turning men off mm. re reading mm. your books yeah. that then we are you know they were saying not enough men are reading fiction there's an enormous untapped market out mm. there of people to read it and as soon as you yeah, and the Rosie Project's described as women's fiction. I think, for goodness sake, yeah. um, you know, this is a book with a male protagonist. It's written by, by a middle-aged mm. man. Um, you know, he hangs out with the blokes and drinks mm -hmm. beer and does all these sorts of things. It's only because it's got a relationship in it. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, 50% yeah. of relationships, you know, <laughs> 50 are men. Yeah, <laughs> it's sort of puzzling, really, isn't it? Um, yeah. Terry, do you notice any sort of particular demographic um, appeal with your... Um, I, the, the, the publishers need to think like that. Mm. Yeah. I mean... Uh, so the, they know how to market it? Well, just for shorthand. Mm. They, th that's been my experience of it, that, that they... And it's very similar to the movies. The movies, you know, they look at it and they say, we need a, we need a comedy. Um, how many laughs has this got in it? And, you know, look, uh, Pretty Woman started off as an extremely tragic story and ended up with being the movie Pretty Woman, because they figured that they could hit a demographic with that, and it was a type of film that they wanted to release. Publishers are not that much different. Um, there hadn't been an international spy thriller, Page Turner, for I don't know how many years that had roamed all around the world, so I got cast, very thankfully. And, you know, but they, they look at international spy thriller, women's fiction, Chicklet. Well, let, let they me say, think let, let like me say that. though, I mean, some of them do. Um, I'm with Text, a small publisher mm -hmm. in Australia, and I'm very happy that Text viewers, it is what it is. It's right, which um, is, yeah, rare. It is This is this yeah. book. Um, my German publishers, and, and Germany was my second best market in the world mm -hmm. after the US, German publishers have a very strong it is what it is sort of story, mm -hmm. whereas the Americans and the Brits have been much more wanting to classify it and yes. say, and look, they do women's fiction, you know? I mean, I'm with publishers who do a lot of women's fiction and say, well, that fits, and they've got a problem. Where's it going to go on the shelf in the bookshop? Mm -hmm. And if it's under literary fiction, it better win a Pulitzer, otherwise it's yes. going nowhere. Mm -hmm. So it's got to go somewhere else. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. One of those genres. And that, so I, I think that, you know, there's so many books. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, just go into any book. So, I, I mean, before mine was published, I, I walked out of one large bookstore and said to my wife and kids, I said, <laughs> well, we're doomed. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I said, there's no hope. You can't be heard above all of this noise. You just can't. But the publishers somehow managed to cut through. Mm. And the, one of the ways they cut through is that sales force out there going to those book buyers and to those retailers and saying, it's the best, you know, chick lit book you've ever read. It may not be the truth, yeah. but they, they will say anything to garner attention and get those people to read it. But then so, beyond that, 
that word of mouth has to kick in, though, legitimately by people of saying... Course. Because the way that I had read all three of your books was, was people going, you should read this, you're going to love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, still, even with, you know, all the different changes in technology, at the end of the day, it's in a big way somebody going, I read this, you'll really like it. Oh, at the end of the day, it's word of mouth. I mean, it really yes. is word of mouth. I think I've had enormous support here in Australia from independent booksellers mm -hmm. in particular to get that moving. You know, my publisher's done great things to get it moving, but that's all they can do. At a certain point, the, the flow on is, is word of mouth, and you really see that. You know, you see a book and go choo, choo, and disappear. Mm -hmm. but, but books like these, you know, like Yarns and Terry's, um, are still there, you know, months, years later selling because that word of mouth, that book club stuff is happening. Leanne, with your career, how much of a slow burn was it? It was a very slow burn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my first book was published, uh, I think, 12 years ago now. Um, and it was published internationally, and it was enough to, uh, to keep me writing. It was enough to keep me employed. and I'd, So I was a freelance advertising copywriter at the time. And so I lay, let my most horrible clients go one by one <laughs> until by the time I'd finished my second book. And so, you know, I wasn't complaining because I was um, earning a living as a published author. But, uh, you know, I was, I, I, it was still that thing. Well, that still happens all the time now when people say, what do you do? And I say, I'm Leon Mariati. And they say, should I know you? <laughs> and I say, it'd be nice if you knew me. <laughs> okay. uh, so, yeah, it took, it took a while. <laughs> um, let me can can I just up. put in 22 years? Thank you very Ooh. much. <laughs> and, and my first book was called Data Modeling Essentials. Yes. Um, <laughs> Which is still available. Wow. Which is still available <laughs> in its third edition. <laughs> let, let me just say something because I think it applies as well. Um, I, one thing I learned writing data modeling essentials is that, you know what, you, there's no point in having the greatest stuff in the world on the page if the reader can't follow it or isn't compelled to keep reading. And, and I think when people say page turner, that is an enormous positive oh, yes. because it says the person is engrossed. Once you have the reader, you can do as you will with them. But if you don't have the reader, you can't do anything. It's such a great pleasure when you read something that's a page turner. Um, now, let me take um, some questions. So I think they'll put... Uh, if you can go to the microphones and line up, that would be great, and then we'll get you questions on mic. So I think they, they said they're going to put a spotlight on because I can't actually see where the mic is myself. They said about halfway up. Oh, there it is. Yeah, OK, great. Thank you. And then there's one over here. So if people just line up on either side, I'll just come back and forth on, on each side. OK, thank you. This is a question for uh, Leanne. Just in Big Little Lies, you deal with abuse. Um, we could say domestic abuse, but it's all abuse. How difficult was it for you to write those particular scenes? Um, it was difficult. So I had done a lot of reading, um, and I had, uh, in my past, dated a very angry man. So I was able to use some of that experience. Um, and it was nice after having written some of those really violent scenes to give, then go back to some of the lovely scenes. In a way, you have to write it in quite a mechanical way. So I guess, you know, I'm still trying to attach myself to the film world again. But I guess it's like when you're trying to do, you know, when they talk about doing a love scene and, and in fact it's all done really mechanically to make it look that way. In the same way, I'm trying to create drama and I'm trying to create... Um, suspense and I'm trying to create her, how she feels um, and make it look visually interesting. So I'm trying to follow all those rules. Um, so it's distressing, but at the same time, I'm, it's my job. Let me say, uh, the, the most difficult part of the rosy effect, the single part I agonised most over was about one sentence where Don has a meltdown and afterwards he says, Rosie was in no danger, I would never have assaulted her. And I, I decided that was not honest, that if you have a meltdown, you're not sure. And, and I changed it to say that he couldn't be sure that he might not have assaulted Rosie and was very frightened by that. And Don is this guy that everybody sort of loves. He's sweet and he's nice. And to have him say something like he could be the perpetrator of domestic violence, I think, am I excusing it? Uh, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. and, and having since published it with that in there, um, I've spoken to a, a few people with Asperger's syndrome who've experienced meltdowns and they have confirmed that they don't feel safe. That you know, some of them do not feel they've got, that, not all of them, but, but some of them don't feel that they've got it under control. Um, and, you know, 
I, I, I don't want to preach on a page, but you certainly want to put things on a page you're as honest as you can make them, particularly in such a, such a sensitive and, you know, an important area. Um, okay, over here. Oh, no, sorry, there is no one there. It's the cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> he must have had just a moment of like, ah! <laughs> this lady up here. Hi, everyone. I just had a question for each of you about if you ever feel isolated whilst writing or lonely and how you deal with, with that aspect of the job, if you feel that way at all. Terry. <laughs> oh, I hate it. <laughs> I just hate it. I mean, I'm more interested in watering the pot plants. I'll even talk to the kids. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the dogs for a walk. I'm forever thinking because you're always confronting your failures, you know? You just, I can't say for anybody else, but if you ever want to go through an experience where you realise you are not good enough or not as good as you would hope to be, <laughs> then become a writer. <laughs> and that's hard to live with. And um, so, yes, it, it, it's, I don't know whether it's lonely, because you know, I'm like a wonderful family life, but it's very frustrating. And you spend all day staring at a screen, and at the end of it, you might have got something down, but you don't feel it's that good. And, you know, I think Dorothy Parker said, I hate writing, but I really enjoy having written... <laughs> I, I think, you know, that sense of achievement. Somebody asked me not so long ago, what was the worst book I've ever read? I've never read a bad book, mm. ever. Because anybody that starts at word one and finishes, writes the end, has my absolute, unadulterated admiration. This is dangerous work because it's not pleasant and you confront yourself every day. So, um, I don't know. I, if I could do something else, believe me, I would. <laughs> Great. No, totally the opposite. I've got the dream job. Um, and any aspect of that job that feels like hard work, I just think this is so much better than database design. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, there will be moments. I've got up touring the US... Um, and it's four o'clock in the morning, I've got a plane to catch, I'm going to be patted down, all that sort of stuff, I'm going to do the same thing the next day. You look in the bleary-eyed into the mirror and you say, nobody is going to be sympathetic for you here, Graham, <laughs> as you go off to set, you know, promote your bestseller. So um, I, I love doing it. The part I love most is when you've got a draft completed and every time you open the lid and do some work on it, you're making it better. And you, know, you think, wow, I've got something and I'm making, I'm making it better all the time. This is, this is the job... I've sort of dreamed about having, and I've just decided I'm going to just love every aspect of it. So. <laughs> Good on you, <laughs> Leah. I think I'm in the, in the middle of you two. <laughs> I, do, I do always rem remember when I was a little girl and I used to write, I'd write just for the pure pleasure of writing. So I would sit down and think, I feel like writing a story now, and I would immediately just be involved with that story. Whereas now, each time when I sit down to write... I do, I do really dislike it a lot in the beginning and I'm frustrated with my own, feel like I'm um, dealing with my own limitations all the time, that I've got something in my head but I can't get it out. And so I, and especially in the beginning of a novel, for the first two thirds of a novel, there's a lot of uh, fumbling. Um, and, but then often towards the end, just as, you know, just before the children are going to come home from school or just before I've got to go out the door, there'll just be a few minutes where I lose myself and I finally achieve that. You know, athletes talk about the zone yes, and yes. Buddha's, you know, <coughs> losing your sense of self. So whenever that happens, then it's wonderful. And that seems to happen more towards the end when it's all coming together and then I do really love it. I was interviewing the author Steve Toltz um, a few days ago and I asked him, how do you find the whole writer's festival circuit, thinking maybe that, you know, Pete, some people find it quite, quite torturous. Mm. And he said, I've been locked in a room for six years, just get me out there, get yeah. me out. <laughs> 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 We've got a question that's come in from Bathurst, uh, Rob from Bathurst. How do you handle editors' notes, comments or criticism, Leanne? Uh, well, the first thing that happens when you get your editor's letter that, and they begin, they've been taught this at editor's school clearly because they begin with, this is the best book I've ever read. Yes. It, is, it is a work of genius. <laughs> and then, me. Yes. Yeah. And then they, they said that to you? Yes, they do. <laughs> they say it to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and then they say, 
but you need to fix this, yeah. this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this. And then at the end they say, but this is a work of genius. It's <laughs> so all sandwich there. There's a name there. <laughs> yes, we yeah. know. I, th I thought I wouldn't use the name. Very, I don't very use very it, yes. It's a shit sandwich, they call it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and, but first of all, I feel um, intense resentment each time I look at the editor's notes and I go and sulk for a lot and think, you know, what do they know? Um, and then I gradually just let it into the back of my mind and then I start to think, well, maybe I won't do that silly thing she suggested, but I could yes. solve the problem if I did this. <laughs> uh, and then I start, then eventually I am actually incredibly my editors are here. I'm incredibly great. <laughs> I'm incredibly, <laughs> incredibly grateful. Um, and I always remember reading an Amazon review and the re reviewer saying something about how I was so um, glad that I finally understood the motivations of such and such a character. And I remember thinking to myself, well, thank God I followed the editor's report, which said we need to understand the motivations of this character. So that's it. Um, and it's always, always a better book as a result. Yeah, I think that that's, that's yes. crucial. Um, when you know from experience that it will be a better book, you've always got that in the back of your mind. While I was studying writing, I made my living by teaching consulting skills. So this is payback for me. This is me having to take <laughs> advice from other people. But what's really important to me, and it doesn't happen, let me tell you, in screenwriting, um, what is really, there is nothing in the Rosie project or the Rosie effect that I not, did not choose and agree to have in there. Nobody, I've never got the excuse that I was made to do that. Nobody made me do anything. There was one time when one of my overseas editors folded her arms and it was pretty much a standoff. It was almost a, we, we will not publish your book unless you make this change. And I folded my arms and thought, you know, so be it. And they published the book and they were fabulous about it. Um, so there's nothing in either book that I've actually um, you know, been pushed into doing. Pushed, yes, but not forced. Um, and, and I think it's a really helpful thing that you know that at the end of the day, people are trying to help you make it better, um, not tell you to make it different, which is different than you're in the movies. Yeah, much different to the movies, mm. but um, I can't tell you. I pre-sold the book to a number mm. of really large <laughs> territories, um, and I saw the publishing deals, which everybody told me were fantastic. I turned to my wife and I said, there's going to be a real, real diminution of our lifestyle, I can tell you that, because this isn't the movies. <laughs> the money in publishing is nothing like in the movies. But I slogged on, delivered them 850 pages, and I got exactly the letter yeah. that you got, that I'm a genius. <laughs> and, and there was nothing that, that needed to be fixed. I thought, it's pretty good. Um, and I heard this from a number of territories. Then one of the biggest territories in the world, three days before Christmas, said it's a great book. Met with all the marketing people. We need to take 350 pages out. Oh. Yeah. I said, oh, yeah. So my wife, who, you know, um, she has her moments, I can tell you. She <laughs> said, tell them to go F themselves. <laughs> and I said... All right, so I called my agent and I said, my wife says, tell them to go F themselves. And he said, you may not get another deal. I said, that's fine. Don't publish it. Publish it in the other territories. We'll let it become, yeah. we hope, a really big seller. And if it is, then we'll auction it for this really large territory. So he went back to them and said, that's it, we're pulling it. Because sooner or later, you know, it's going to be your name on it. Yeah. And it means something to you. Mm. Hopefully it means a lot to the reader. Mm. But look, <laughs> like Graham, I mean, I'm not going to put anything in there that I don't agree with. And I, I take 350 pages and it wasn't my book. It was a different thing. Just one thing, if Michael Haywood, who's my editor, is out there in the audience, Michael, um, can you just take note about that genius bit I've read? <laughs> 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 so they... Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were confronted with an issue of did they want to publish it or not? Because if they were going to publish it, it was going to be more or less in this form. And uh, they decided to publish it. I've never heard a word. About, <coughs> I've never heard... Oh, no, we're going to do this. Sorry, I thought um, you'd finish your story. Um, um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, they published it. I never heard a word again about whoever made this suggestion. So, yeah, get up and fight for it, I reckon. <laughs> But over here. Sorry to interrupt your meat story there. I thought you'd be done. Hello. Um, my question relates to you as a writer when you sit down. Um, who do you write for? Is it 
for yourself because you have a story that you want to tell and and you want to explore certain characters? Or is it because you want to entertain us, the reader? I'll answer that first, if you like, um, because somebody asked me that just the other day and it made me really think pretty hard about it. But I... I am not thinking of a particular person. I'm not even thinking of a particular demographic. I'm thinking of the generic reader, if you like. So there is somebody out there because I am trying to engage them. I am trying to tell the story in a compelling way. But I guess the metaphor for me, I said I was in the hotel across there, was if all the people in the hotel bar were to suddenly sit down and I was to tell them a story, that's, that's the sort of place I want to be, that this random group of people are out there, I'm telling a story and I'm trying to tell it the best way I possibly can, because people do engage in a pretty common sort of way. Yeah. Um, I think I'm just writing it for me, really, um, because I find if I, tra if otherwise, sometimes I've, I do have a tendency to let voices in, and so then I can, I'm thinking of good things people have said, where they've said, oh, I love that. And then I'm thinking, oh, but am I doing that again? Or I hear remembering things other people said they hated that, and I can hear that, eh, I hated that, and I'm going to hate this character. Um, so as soon as those voices start, I have to stop and just think, no, I, well, am I, especially because I don't know what's going to happen, I just keep asking, am, am I interested enough to know what's, what's going to happen next? So. Yeah, I, if I write it for you, it's commerce, you know? If I write it for me, it's art. And, uh, <laughs> So at my age, no, at my <laughs> age, I'm an artist. <laughs> um, we've got another question from Bathurst, Roz from Bathurst. In the books you wrote that weren't blockbusters, what was missing? Let me ask you, Leanne. Um, well, some of the books that weren't blockbusters went on to become yeah. blockbusters yes. much later yeah. after the... So it was just that nothing was missing, you just didn't know about them. Um, mm. But I do feel that I added uh, more suspense to my later novels. So in The Hypnotist Love Story, I started to play around with the genre of suspense. And I do feel that's one book that some, uh, some readers start to get a bit frustrated with because they recognise that and they were thinking something much bigger is going to happen and then it was, all, it was just a nice story. So... Mm. Uh, and my American editor, after The Husband's Secret, did send a long email um, talking about my next book, but basically she was saying, do that again. <laughs> um, which is basically, I think, yeah, adding just, I think, for me, the suspense. Right. Mm. Graham, any thoughts on that? Well, no, I've only had the two books, unless you count the data modelling one. I was going to say, the data modelling, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, what, what was wrong with the data modelling book? <laughs> it was great. It was a blockbuster it, in, it, in its world. I did, <laughs> I did want to ask you before, because I was obviously I hadn't heard of it, and I was thinking to myself, was that like actually a non-fiction book about data modelling, or was it a fiction book with a really bad <laughs> <The> title? <laughs> <laughs> um, now, have we got any more questions from the floor? Um, anyone else like to ask something? Let me just ask one... Oh, because we're basically out of time. Let me just quickly ask one question and just, um, you know, answer it succinctly. Um, because the session was called The Books That Exploded, how has it impacted each of your life to have works that have just gone absolutely gangbusters, Leanne? Uh, I guess it just means the... It means things like getting up in the middle of the night and suddenly you're on a radio station because they keep you up all night doing the radio interviews, so suddenly I'm an, on a, ra a breakfast show in Baltimore and they're saying, oh, Australian, you must know Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. So <laughs> they're saying, here, sing it. And so I'm suddenly oh. singing Skippy. <laughs> I'm not a very good singer. Um, and I'm exhausted, so I, and I got so tired, I started telling the people of some town in America all about a strawberry farmer I, who I didn't end up dating. <laughs> never, I never told anybody that story before. So it's little surreal things like that and the emails that you get um, and being able to go over there. But for the most part, it makes actually no difference whatsoever. I'm still at my desk writing. Graham? Oh, look, it's really nice that for all those people who thought you would never amount to anything, <laughs> <laughs> to, to have visibly amounted to something. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, you know, as I say, I, I'm, I'm a happier person than I was because this is, as I say, my dream job. I've said that lots of times, so I'm having fun. Um, I'm 64 and I'm an overnight sensation. It's been fantastic. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
so Graham will be upstairs signing the data modelling handbook for anyone that's... <laughs> um, no, they'll be upstairs in the Ruth Cracknell uh, rooms. Thank you so much to all of you. That was really interesting. Thank you very much to all Thank of you, you as well. Thank you.